This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. Talking about climate sometimes feels difficult, even as more people are directly feeling the impacts. We're not listening to each other at all, and we're not listening to each other what each other is listening to either with the media silization that's happened. Journalist Mira Subramanian has spent years talking with some of the people living closest to climate change in parts of the country where climate science isn't always trusted. Part of the problem, she says, is the lack of conversation among people who don't agree. Both sides are not listening to each other. I think it's really easy for people on the climate activist side to completely and utterly dismiss the people who are skeptical um, and vice versa. And so I think going in and trying to understand what is driving somebody, what are, what are they thinking about in the middle of the night? Climate One's empowering conversations explore all aspects of the climate emergency. On today's show, we'll talk with Subramanian about the importance of listening and how our identities and values shape the way we understand others' climate experience. And we'll explore the stories we tell ourselves to cope with climate disruption and other human impacts on the environment. How do we understand a natural disaster if it's not, you know, a fire at our door or if it's not water rising um, in our driveway? What's the psychological um, ramifications of this? Nathaniel Rich is author of the new book, Second Nature, Scenes from a World Remade. He explores how humans have fundamentally changed the planet and how we struggle to define our place on it and maintain optimism amid grim headlines and personal experiences. Rich says the values that were at play during the early history of nature conservation. Fairness, a sense of restraint, a sense of uh, long-term thinking and a sense of, of, you know, appreciating our blessings. He says that's a valuable mindset to hold on to as we explore radical ideas and technologies like geoengineering and de-extinction intended to correct human impact on the world around us. We should be guided by not just, you know, how do we improve things? How do we, how do we um, avoid the worst of climate change or, or any other environmental you know, scourge? Um, but how do we make the world truer to, the, to, to our highest ideals? Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson proposed setting aside half of the earth for conservation, and that in turn spawned a global effort to protect 30% of land by 2030. What do you think of those efforts to set aside X percent? Will that change human relationship with nature? I think it's a great goal to have. I, I think uh, I would love if we could achieve that. Um, I, I do think it's important to, to recognize, however, that already there's no such thing as a wilderness that hasn't already been altered dramatically by, by our presence. And even the act of putting aside nature, he's not really proposing that we necessarily just let it go. Um, we're now at a point where we also have to protect it and defend it against any number of, of possible, you know, issues, climate, climate change being just one of them. Nathaniel, in the book, you write about Stephen Conley, an atmospheric scientist in California who has a freelance business flying over oil and gas fields, measuring methane concentrations leaking out of them. One day in 2015, he was flying over Aliso Canyon in Southern California. What did he discover? Yeah, he, he had heard there was a gas leak. Uh, coming from uh, this gas facility in, in Porter Ranch, which is sort of north Los Angeles. And the numbers that he detected over, over this canyon in this beautiful sort of suburban type environment were catastrophic beyond anything he'd ever, ever seen, beyond, you know, what he'd seen going over, you know, places like the Bakken in, in you know, North Dakota. And, and this was the beginning of a of a saga that's still going on many years later of, uh, you know, what basically was a leaking gas well um, ended up becoming one of the greatest climate disasters in history. There was a litigation. The company Southern California Gas settled for with government agencies for about $130 million. I believe there's a class action lawsuit representing 35,000 people that's winding its way through the courts going on, as you said. Porter Ranch is an affluent and somewhat conservative community nearby. What was the impact of this leak on residents and their attitudes toward fossil fuels? Yeah, that was the most interesting part of it to me, that people in this community were mostly freaked out that they were getting poisoned by by the gas. 
it was an old oil well that had been converted into a natural gas storage facility. So the people in this very wealthy uh, community, as you said, pretty conservative, um, panicked and and they saw it as their Chernobyl and they fled and many reported health problems and many others did not. And 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 it became this this very strange sociological experiment as much as a, you know, as a chemistry experiment about how do people respond when they're told that there's a huge cloud of poisonous gas that they can't see in their community? You know, how, how, how do we understand a natural disaster if it's not, you know, a fire at our door or if it's not uh, water rising um, in our driveway? What's the psychological um, ramifications of this and and what I discovered was fascinating and basically it it varies on you know depending on the person but the way people responded tell, tells you a lot about who they are and the community in, in, in a certain way was started tearing itself apart as a result the one thing nobody was really concerned about in the whole community was the effect on climate change you know the the proof of the health effects is still being litigated and and studied but what's what's uh, what we know is that the amount of of um, methane that that went into the atmosphere was gargantuan, and of course, you know, as with anything with climate change, it's it's cumulative. The amount of greenhouse gases we put in the atmosphere and the damage we do, but but nobody in this community really thought about that aspect of it at all. It was all about how is this immediately hurting me, my family, or my property values. Another person you write about is Robert Billet, who is a lawyer in Cincinnati. One day, a burly cattle rancher from West Virginia named Wilbur Tennant came to his office with boxes of videotapes, photographs, and documents. What story unfolded from those boxes? Yeah, it's one of the craziest stories I've I've ever come across, and it, it ended up being made into a really great movie that I, I recommend to, to your listeners named, uh, called Dark Waters um, with Mark Ruffalo playing the lot. He's a corporate lawyer in Cincinnati working for, uh, they basically represent chemical companies. They're, they're environmental lawyers for the defense. And Balot, who's an up and coming guy, himself fairly, fairly conservative guy, gets this call from a cattle rancher who says that his cows are dying right and left. And he thinks it's because they're drinking uh, something poisonous from the creek that runs through the property. The creek uh, runs from um, a site that's owned by DuPont which has this enormous chemical uh, factory uh, in this town of Parkersburg, West Virginia, where they make things like Teflon and other things that we encounter in our every day in our lives. And he, he thinks that DuPont is, is up to something. And nobody in town, nobody in Parkersburg will believe him. It's a corporate town. Everyone works for DuPont one way or another. And Balot explains, you know, I'm not the right guy for the job. I'm I defend chemical companies, you know, <laughs> uh, you, you want to press a lawsuit against the world's biggest chemical company. But this cattle farmer makes a personal appeal. It turns out that he got Rob's number because Rob's uh, grandmother is friends uh, with, with the, the cattle farmer's neighbor. So he has a soft spot uh, for this community and he agrees to take the case thinking that it'll amount to nothing. What it does end up amounting to is the saga that's lasted now for more than 20 years has exposed one of the biggest corporate conspiracies um, in in the world. The chemical is PFOA. How prevalent is that today in humans and animals? It's in all of our bloodstream. <laughs> um, it's it's universal. It's it's found. It's been found in the blood of every living organism that it that's been tested for it, and it has been in you know found in blood banks going back decades. Um, in studies done by DuPont itself and not not made public at the time, but but discovered and exposed by by Balot. The main way I think we encountered it um, in the past was through nonstick cookware. We were, of course, told it was safe uh, always for decades, but on, on high heat, it would leach off into the food and get in your bloodstream. And the, the most terrifying thing about this stuff, these man-made chemicals, is they're bonded together to an extraordinary degree. And because of that, it doesn't biodegrade. It doesn't, doesn't go out of your blood. So once it's in your body, um, it stays there. 
this part of a family called the Forever Chemicals. Yeah, Forever Chemicals, yeah. Right. And one of the parallels with climate that I, struck me when I was reading this was how there were scientists at the company, uh, and there was even one meeting where, where scientists and lawyers said, we got to stop this stuff, right? And, and the company knew, and it, it violated its own rules about handling of this stuff. There was internal dissent. We shouldn't do this. Similar to scientists who raised warnings inside oil companies. So there's some real interesting parallels. Yeah, it's the same story over and over again. It's the corporate playbook going back to Philip Morris and the you know tobacco industry. And it's truly shocking. I mean, Rob, basically what he did is he forced DuPont to give him you know thousands and th really millions of pages of documents. And he put together this incredible, uh, incredibly damning history uh, going back uh, to the 1950s. Um, of DuPont knowing this stuff was bad, knowing it was causing all kinds of health effects uh, related to you know, cancers, birth d deformities, all kinds of terrible health conditions. And it continued to pump out this stuff because it was making more than a billion dollars a year in profit. And so, you know, it's a level of, of villainy that is, you know, really goes beyond what you'd expect to find even in a comic book or something. Yeah, that's why it made for such a great film. I tried to get uh, my family to uh, to get rid of the Teflon pans for years unsuccessfully, but as soon as uh, my wife saw uh, Dark Waters, those pans went in the garbage that, that <laughs> night. That's, that, happened to, that happened to my own mother, too. And, and I said, wait a minute, you know, I wrote the piece. Like, you didn't, when I wrote the story about it in the New York Times magazine originally, like, that didn't, that didn't cause you to, to, to throw out the pants, but when Mark Ruffalo is throwing out the pants, then finally you, you take it seriously. So, you know, whatever it takes. She loves you, but you're not Mark Ruffalo. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. One of the key players you also write about is Auden Schendler, an executive at Aspen Ski Company. He compared climate change to civil rights and said Aspen could tell a story that catalyzes change, as Selma did. And when I read that, I thought, well, well, Aspen and Selma, those are two very different places. Help us understand about how Aspen can be a vehicle or model for change. It's funny. I think he was onto something there in in comparing the climate, you know, fight for climate policy to a certain aspect of the civil rights struggle, I, you've seen you've seen a lot of the same tactics and language used, for instance, by the Sunrise Movement and the Green New Deal. They're um, you know they're also making more explicit that climate change affects us disproportionately. That the people who are most um, harmed by it are those who are already the most harmed by our, our systems of 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 governance and and these sort of racist structures embedded in, in society and that, that you can't address one without the other. But yes, it, it does strike a different chord to say that Aspen, Colorado could be Selma, but, I, but Schindler's point was that we can lead the, lead the way, essentially, and that we, could, we can show in Aspen, you know, the richest Maybe, I don't know, is it the richest place in the world? It feels like it. It's, a, it's an enclave. Certainly a lot of very wealthy people get there. So, But that theory of change is an elite-led theory of change, right. which is different than civil rights, yes. which was more grassroots. So as someone who's, you know, you have studied um, individuals taking on powerful interests from the 70s to now, what do you think of that, looking to elite individuals and places as leading the way off fossil fuels? Is that folly? Is that... I don't think it has to be... It doesn't have to be an either or. I, I wouldn't... Sure. You know, I, th I think certainly people who are in a position uh, where they don't have to worry about any financial costs, they should be taking big swings at this thing. Is that sufficient? No, of course not. Is that... But it's... Better to have them on your side. Right. Yeah, it's better to have them on your side than, than than pushing against you, which also happened at Aspen, where one of the Koch brothers was pushing in the other direction. Yeah, one of one of one of the Koch brothers, uh, Bill, owns a compa compound right outside of Aspen that's bigger than Aspen um, in a in his own mountain valley. He was opposing Schindler, although uh, much of that had to do with water rights. But yeah, Schindler's point was that you know because they had so much money, they could um, really take ambitious measures. And, and his, he saw it as his mission to convince the powers that be in Aspen to follow through on it. So, you know, to move the town entirely off onto renewable energy. But yes, it, what was fascinating to me about this story was this kind of 
extreme hypo- hypocrisy of a place where most people fly in on their private jets and are you know CEOs of of industries that are responsible for for the you know brunt of our, our carbon emissions, patting itself on the back and and taking leadership of the problem, um, and yet you know there there is something valuable, very valuable about what Chandler himself is doing and in trying to convert these people to his way of thinking. So. Those are stories that fascinate me. Some com- combination of just huge ambition and and obsession and effort to try to solve a problem paired with colossal folly and uh, you know hypocrisy. You're listening to a Climate One conversation about the climate stories we tell ourselves. I've been speaking with author Nathaniel Rich. Coming up, he talks about the role of writers to capture the human condition amid climate disruption. What do we make of? of the fact that we're living at this in this moment in this age where we have this enormous dread of the future so much is at stake how does our knowledge of this of this oncoming catastrophe or this ongoing catastrophe touch our lives today that's up next when climate 1 continues this is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton, and we're talking with two writers about the way identity, values, and experience shape people's own climate stories. Nathaniel Rich is a journalist based in New Orleans and author of the new book, Second Nature, Scenes from a World Remade. I asked him where he thinks his writing fits in the larger climate conversation. He makes a distinction between what he calls activist writing, which pushes the reader to act, and what he does. I think there's also room for stories about um, some of these these places where there's there's moral tension and there's complexity as as in Aspen as in the Porter Ranch um, case where there's not necessarily a right and a wrong or where there's or where there's some some messy middle um, that that emerges and those are the kinds of stories that interest me and and I think because we've you know because we've had such a um, horribly politicized conversation about you know, climate, but also environmentalism for so long, where you have one side just having to fight so hard just to, you know, explain why it's important to lower carbon emissions, um, that we haven't begun to have some of the more difficult conversations about ways in which we're going to solve some of these problems. And uh, that's ultimately where I think so much of the dramatic tension of of the stories comes from, or, or, you know, where it's there's not necessarily a good guy and a bad guy. And you write about good guys um, in your previous book, Losing Earth. Uh, it's a sobering narrative about a forgotten moment when a small group of people risk their careers to speak truth to power about what you call our suicide pact with fossil fuels. And this is so painful. You're writing about 1979 to 1989, which is so painful because we've heard so many times we have a decade to turn the climate around. This is the defining decade, right? We've heard that again, you know, 10 years. And yet you write about a 10-year period that could have been decisive. Does that just bum you out when you know that we had it? Yeah, they were, and they were saying that in 1979 too. You know, they were saying we have about 10 years to figure it out. And I think... Um, they were right. They were right. I mean, we to, in order to keep, you know, CO two levels where they were historically. Now we're talking about keeping CO two levels to where we don't have a just totally profound cataclysms. So that, to me, was the most dramatic story about climate change that I could write because you know we know what's happened from 1989 or so to the to the present, where you've had the emergence of this oil and gas lobby fighting any, you know, tooth and nail, any kind of climate policy. You've had the, the issue become politicized. And there's, as a result, there's been total paralysis basically on, on policy. But what's, what's fascinating about the period between 1979 and 1989 is that there weren't political coalitions um, for or against climate policy. Uh, the oil and gas industry, which understood the problem, it was doing nothing to, you know, to try to help it also hadn't uh, coordinated on uh, an attack on any kind of meaningful change. In fact, there were people, prominent people in the industry who publicly were saying, you know, something has to be done. And you had this small group of people in Washington, primarily policy people who, for the first time, understood the problem, saw it clearly, and tried to figure out a way to, you know, bring it to the attention of the of the public uh, and, and the global public and and try to get something done. And they, they actually came very close to what they saw as a solution 
which was a global treaty to to curb carbon emissions. And one of the lessons from that period is you have said that patient rational argument has severe political limitations. Do you think a conversation on public radio and podcasts as you and I are having now is meaningful? Is this kind of rational, calm uh, conversation delusional given the need for transformative change to save humanity's bacon, life as we know it? Well, I think there. I think it's important to separate two two different motivations. I mean, is is a podcast going to change the world? I'm I'm sorry to <laughs> say I don't think <laughs> no. so. Is that, um, nor will a magazine article or a book probably. Um, right. But there's the activist question of how do we get people to move on this? How do we get politicians to move on that? But I think there's another question um, that I think writers should be asking, which is, what do we make of of the fact that we're living at this in this moment in this age where we have this enormous dread of the future so much is at stake how does our knowledge of this of this oncoming catastrophe or this ongoing catastrophe touch our lives today and i think that's there's there's a job of writers in in every age to try to understand the ways in which the public crises of the of the moment and the threats touch the inner lives, uh, the private lives of, of the people who are, are living today. And that's a very different, you know, that's not trying to negotiate the new treaty, but these are still very big questions and worthy of scrutiny. Yeah. And help us des- describe and, and understand what, what can narrative literature accomplish that other forms of writing and journalism can't? You think that there's some real power and liberty in narrative literature? I do. And I, I think that that's why I've chosen the narrative form to to write about these things. I think through narrative writing, um, through storytelling with characters, with you know whether fictional or non-fictional, where you can go deep into the inner lives of the characters, you're able to 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 ask some of these deeper questions. It's it's really only through narrative that you can get into these questions of you know how do these how do these great public crises enter into a, the 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 fabric of our of our reality. And um, I, I've been struck uh, over the years, and this is why I ended up writing these 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 books, that very few writers have written about climate change or some of these these environmental global environmental issues through narrative. You have you have first person journalism, which is could be a kind of narrative, which is like you know a reporter goes to a place, describes what. You know, she sees and writes about it. Yeah, Elizabeth Colbert has done that. The first climate book I read was Field Dose from a Catastrophe. Yeah, but you're right. I think, I think, they're, they're issue books, right? They're not a lot of characters, right? Right. Yeah, it, it's the climate, you know, it, it's such a big thing that it doesn't have a lot of um, memorable standout characters, heroes and villains. It's not. And, and it doesn't have to be, um, you know, superheroes and super, super yeah. villains. I think it, <laughs> yeah. I think what's more valuable is the way ordinary people, you know, how has this changed the fabric of our, of our lives? I, th- I would say it's, it's transformed it, especially for younger people that we now see the world through this lens of disaster and, and dread to some extent. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people when I was doing the tour for Losing Earth came up after events and said, I'm so upset about climate change that I don't want to have children or I'm, mm. I'm afraid to have children. I don't think it's, mm. it's, it's morally justified to have children. That's, that issue is kind of the wedge into this, this, this deeper anxiety and fear that, that we've, we're experiencing. NASA recently reported that 2020 tied with 2016 as the warmest year on Earth. You tweeted that news and said last year was likely the coolest year of the rest of our lives. <laughs> what does that mean to you personally? And you know, and if I don't know if you have a family or plan to have a family, you know, how does that affect you? Yeah, that was a note of sunny optimism for me. Um, <laughs> I yeah, I have. As I was writing Losing Earth, my wife and I had our first child, and and as I was writing Second Nature, I had my second. Um, so yes, this is very, very much something that I think about, and I think like anybody else, add add to that the fact that I I own property in New Orleans, which is one of the most you know cities most threatened by climate change in the in the world. Um, and sometimes I freak out about it. Sometimes I sort of don't think about it. And and I think like most of us, I go between the poles. I make calculated decisions. I'm I'm probably the you know victim of my own optimism at times. But that's that's very much the stuff. That's exactly what I want to write about. You know, that to try to understand why 
how does someone like me, who's pretty well acquainted with the dangers of living in, um, you know, a, a city like New Orleans uh, in a climate in, the, in our climate age, why do I choose to live here? Um, well, there's a long, you know, there's, I have a long explanation, but that that's sort of the story of our time, and that's what I want to write about. We all have contradictions and nuances. That's that's what makes us human and, and interesting. Nathaniel Rich is author of Second Nature, Scenes from a World Remade. He also wrote Losing Earth, which depicts the period from 1979 to 89, in which Republicans and Democrats accepted fundamental climate science and sought to act upon it. Nathaniel Rich, thanks for coming on Climate One. I really appreciate your writing and your work. Thanks so much for having me. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. This is Climate One. Today, I'm talking with two noted writers about identity and values tied to the stories we tell ourselves about climate disruption. Mira Subramanian is a journalist covering culture and the environment. She's written for publications including The New York Times, Nature, Orion, and Inside Climate News. I asked her how she writes about boundaries and identity when she covers climate. Mainly by going in and listening to people. I think that they're, I mean, identity politics has now dominated uh, life in America today. And so I think that comes from a place of um, something stronger where people really do have strong identities to their place, which is something that I like to focus on a lot, um, and to their communities, to their to their people that they care about. Um, and a lot of times I think that the a lot of the boundaries and the friction that we're experiencing now are just where there seems like there's clashing, but there often is actually ways that we could be finding more overlap there. Hmm. So we're not listening to each other. We're not listening to each other at all. And we're not listening to each other, what each other is listening to either with the media silosization that's happened, right? Right, right. So how do you get people to listen to you and how do you listen to them? So much of what has been um, explored around talking about climate change is that people aren't listening to why people either care about it deeply, are very much against it and want don't want to believe that it's happening, or are in the place in between, where which is where many Americans are, where they're just um, uh, busy doing other things, or they feel uh, intimidated by the science. There's just so many reasons why people might be resistant or engaged or um, dismissive, just to use the the, the six Americans um, idea that comes out of George Mason, uh, that that there are these six Americans. And that's a, I think that's a fair, accurate representation. And when I've been out um, reporting, sometimes I'm seeking out people that are on certain sides of the spectrum. But what I often find is that both sides are not listening to each other. I think it's really easy for people on the climate activist side to completely and utterly dismiss the people who are skeptical um, and vice versa. And so I think going in and trying to understand what is driving somebody, what are, what are they thinking about in the middle of the night? Because everybody's kind of up in the middle of the night, I think, especially yeah, <laughs> these days. I am. Yeah. So, <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> so, what are those driving um, concerns? What are they worried about? And I think what is where the opportunity is is that there's so many places where addressing climate change can address those midnight worries for everybody, no matter which of the six Americans you are. And that sometimes means that you have to let go of, you know, going back to identity, letting go of your own story about why it why a topic concerns you and listening to what somebody is saying about why it might concern them. Yeah, there's sort of this immediate, immediate kind of rebuttal. You know, there's sort of, I, I find this like, oh, it kind of the re re pounce on each other what people say and rebut without really absorbing or reflecting. And there's often a lot of fear, I think, underneath the oh, Right. The and anger. what happens with yeah. that? I mean, psych psychologists tell us, and we all know, we all get our defenses up when we feel attacked. It's just a human response. And so we have to hold ideas and facts accountable, right? There have to be there has to be accountability around what is actually happening uh, on the scientific level. Um, but just beating people over the head with that is not the way that that, that, that narrative changes. Right. There's so many, yeah, you have your fact, I have my fact. We can go counterfact, counterfact, back and forth. And that doesn't 
go anywhere. You you traveled across the U.S. in 2017, seeking out the most conservative communities directly experiencing climate impacts for Inside Climate News. You've described that project as, quote, a chance to leap over the political divide and find stories of people's lived lives, not the check the box answers of big data and algorithms that neglect hope, fear, and middle of the night dreams. So tell me more about that. It was a really amazing project. It was um, right after the 2016 election. I think people who have been working on climate for a long time had just come out of, um, I would say, you know, five, 10 years where the thinking was like, oh, we just need to get more facts to people. Like people just don't understand the science. If we just get the more information, surely everyone will be worried. The information and, deficit <laughs> hypothesis. <Yes. laughs> and so that didn't work so well. And and the more that um the more that the result of coming out of that 2016 election showed that um actually action on climate was regressing and was definitely going to go um really backwards under the Trump administration. So the question was like, how can we go out and, and listen to people and figure out what what's going on? There was definitely a divide in the country that came out through the election. Uh, there was a growing divide within the news and the media landscape, um, which is definitely dominated by uh, coastal entities that do not spend a lot of time in rural communities and a lot of places where people where the where the uh, vote went heavily for Trump. And so um, Inside Climate News reached out to me about doing a series of stories just to try to f- listen and figure out what was going on um, mm-hmm. and how people were thinking about climate change mm-hmm. in these communities that had gone so heavily for Trump. And what are some standout people? What are some of the stories that people are telling themselves in those the red America where they're feeling climate impacts? What's their story? Everybody was seeing that there were changes. I mean, that just felt like it was unquestionable that people were seeing changes. It was where how people were explaining what they were seeing mm-hmm. um, and what they thought should be done about it, which is where where the friction comes from. The divergence is what do we do about it, markets or government, right? That's where yeah. people kind of, I don't want to recognize the problem because I don't like the solution. Right, right. That came up a lot. I heard a lot about um regulation, over-regulation. Most of these stories led me to very rural areas um, in uh, Wisconsin and Georgia and West Virginia, um, Montana. These are places, these are communities that are, I mean, to put it bluntly, these are communities that are often dying. The infrastructure is gone. Um, The educated people have left because there's no jobs. Um, I kept hearing about labor shortages, and these are people that are really, like I said, tied to their land. Often their livelihood is tied to their land. So they are feeling the impacts first. I mean, it was really interesting sitting down with ranchers in North Dakota and and saying, you know, I'm here coming from New England where there's a lot of people upset about climate change, but arguably you're feeling the impacts a lot more than a lot of people that are hollering for action. But um, I also did find that the... The question about where people are getting their information really is percolating down across the board. I would hear uh, talking points straight down from Fox News about um, this has always happened. This is just a natural cycle. It'll get cold again. You know, every, every little, it was kind of fun. Every every little tiny counter argument I would hear, I would spend probably way too excessive amounts of time um, fact checking. So, you know, when when a Wisconsin dog sledder tells me, oh, well, it's it's because there's volcanoes under Antarctica that the ice is melting. That's why it's melting. And so I would spend time looking for through the peer reviewed studies and uh, there are volcanoes under Antarctica. They are causing melting. But then that last step of connecting it to that, the, the, the scientists have figured that into their equations. They've figured out the solar cycles and solar flares and all of that. And that has all gone into the models that are telling us that we're warming now faster than we ever have before. And that it is the fingerprints of, of human burning of fossil fuels is the reason why we're seeing the warming that we are. So that last part of the equation was gone, but these little kernels, these little cherry-picked data facts um, would get out and get amplified and um, people take them to heart. You're listening to Climate One. 
Mira Subramanian is a journalist whose reporting has taken her across the United States to discover how Americans perceive climate change in their own backyard. Coming up, she shares stories about the interconnectedness of climate in our air, water, and food. Everybody is starting to realize that you cannot tease apart one part of this equation and just work on one problem and think that you can solve it because it is so inextricably linked to everything else. That's up next when Climate One continues. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. Today, we're exploring the climate stories we tell ourselves with journalists Nathaniel Rich and Mira Subramanian. In 2017, Subramanian traveled across the country for Inside Climate News, seeking out the most conservative communities directly experiencing climate impacts. She related one story about Georgia peach farmers grappling with loss of their crop because winters didn't get cold enough. The farmers that I met was the Dickey Farm in middle Georgia. Um, they were seeing the changes, but they were saying, oh, this could happen. It can get it can get cold again. Um, you know, but at the same time, they were experimenting with varieties that were more adapted to a warmer climate. And they are hedging their bets and they're figuring out if they can diversify. And they're doing all of the, you know, what what climate um, people who advocate for climate action talk about adaptation, right? Mitigation, adaptation. you know, they, they were doing adaptation. They just don't want to call it climate change. So there it was really about dancing around the, a term that has become so incredibly loaded. Mm -hmm. um, but they were adapting. At one point I said, like, how many, how many more failed peach harvests would you have to go through before you, you start really a thinking about this differently. And he laughed and he said, maybe one. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so he was one person who stuck with me. Um, another person who really stuck with me was a fly fisherman in Montana. Uh, very conservative, um, um, pro-life and uh, small businesses, doesn't like regulations. Um, but he was seeing the changes. Uh, every, he, he fly fishes every single day. He gets out on the water. Um, he has a river right behind his house. He runs an outfitting company. And he was seeing the changes. He was, you know, he is, I opened that piece talking about how basically fly fishermen are like, uh, are like climate scientists. They are constantly reading the environment around them. They're looking at what is what insects are hatching when, what they look like, uh, what they can do to mimic the natural ecosystem so that they can get this fish that they want to get. They're watching how the water is moving. They're watching the weather. They are paying attention to every aspect of their natural world, and they're in it and observing it so closely. Um, and so he was noticing that uh, insects were hatching a month earlier than they should have. And he was noticing that they were closing down the rivers, his like the, these beautiful blue ribbon Montana fly fishing rivers that they were being closed down more and more because the waters were getting too warm and it stresses out the fish to catch them and release them, which is what they do there. Um, and they just have to basically shut down the fishing. So people who come from all over the world, all over the world to, to stay at his, at his lodge and go out fishing, they don't want to get out there and find out that half the time they can't go out and fish because it, because the water's too warm. He was open to, to understanding about the impact of climate and Part of it was the um, idea of the trusted messenger. And this mm. is an important part about climate communication is it, it's important about who people are hearing uh, that climate change is an issue. It's important who they hear that from. So a neighbor of his who he trusted, who was a geologist, was giving a talk on the geology of Montana, like the most politically neutral <laughs> subject you could imagine. And in the middle of his slide presentation, he says, you know, what we're seeing now is unprecedented. It has, it, the climate has always changed, but it has never changed at this rate before. And the only explanation is what humans are doing to the atmosphere. And he took that in. He trusted the messenger. He, 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 it was not being presented as anything political or loaded. He, it was just information. And he just continued to pursue that and, um, and educate himself in his own way. And he, and he's now deeply concerned and he's working on trying to get other fly fishing um, people in the fly fishing community to, to really work on doing what they can to make sure that the, that this thing that they love to do can be done 
going into the future. Yeah, trusted a messenger is so important. Mira Subramanian is a journalist covering culture and the environment whose reporting has taken her across the U.S. to discover how Americans perceive climate change in their own backyards. Your 2015 book, A River Runs Again, explores how ordinary people in India are working to move the country forward for a more sustainable future. How did research and writing that book widen your own understanding of the global nature of climate challenges? Yeah, that was, um, I just saw all these dots connecting while I worked on that book. Um, you know, I was actually in my in 20s, I did, uh, I was doing environmental nonprofit work, including living on a farm and teaching sustainable skills and growing organic food. And we were uh, developing clean, efficient wood cook stoves for use in the developing world. And so all of that um, were, they were basically the same topics that I ended up focusing the book on, um, which the, the book is framed around the five elements, earth, fire, water, air, and ether. And then for each element, I chose one story of um, an issue that Indians were facing and how they were facing it. So uh, the, the earth story was about the rise of organic agriculture in response to the green revolution um, and water restoration efforts. And so different topics, different stories that I would dive deep in each one. And so these were topics that I had been studying for, for 20 years by the time I had gotten out and done the reporting. And so that, but the changes that I was seeing were connecting to climate in such an important way that um, I think even if I wrote the book again now, five years later, I would write it very differently. This is like how much these dots are connecting constantly about you can't care about one aspect of the environment without finding a climate change impact. So for issues around, say, you're concerned about birds, like bird conservation, you just like to bird watch, there's a climate impact. You're concerned about food, agriculture is being impacted by climate, water is being impacted by climate. Every single issue that you can think of around the environment and our natural resources, and I, the book is actually called Elemental India, and, and I was thinking about these as very elemental things that humans need. You know, there's all these things that we want and there's all these things that we enjoy, but there are these fundamental, elemental things that we need and they're water and they're air and they're food. Mm. And they um, are very, very dependent on how we treat our natural environment and climate is affecting all of them. Yeah, as well as the, the energies embedded in everything that we do, touch, eat every day. So there's the, the, the causes are also in everything, you know, the, the microphone, this chair, this computer, everything. It's, it's, it's mind boggling because it's everywhere. Yeah, and that was part of what I was addressing with the, with the, with the book because India is at a very interesting inflection point where, um, you know, I write a little bit about the, there was a huge, huge blackout in India at one point. I think this was in 2011 or 12. Um, 300 million people out of power, right? That's that's the population of the United States. Just to, <laughs> So 300 million people out of power, but a vast majority of those people didn't even know they were out of power because they never had power in the first place. So there's these huge, you know, we, India is this growing powerhouse on the, on the global um on the global stage, but there are huge numbers of people that didn't have access to clean water, don't have access to energy. Our, um, the, the fire um, chapter is about clean uh, cook stoves because most of India still, at that point, 60% of people were using open fires for at least part of their energy needs every single day. So how the, the driving question of the book is how do you get all the resources that can give those people access to the elemental needs that they that they that they need how do you get them that without further degrading the natural environment that they live in and the the, the answer is that you tap into renewable resources you know whether that's education for girls or renewable energy sources from solar to to drive an induction electric stove you know that there's just you have to tap into something that is going to keep lasting that is sustainable or it's just not it doesn't work or indigenous cultures would say stop treating resources as things to be exploited and have more respect and a different relationship and even think of rivers as mothers and uh you know rivers have and lakes having rights and so it changes the way that we think about these things that are 
to be exploited in service of humans. Right. We've been talking in this episode about preserving our own idealistic and optimistic nature while coping with the loss and nostalgia of losing our environment to climate change, like you've just been talking about. How do you see this tension play out in your own work, sort of, you know, trying to be optimistic, but recognizing the loss around us? Yeah, that that's something I sit with every single time I sit down to write. It is um, it is really challenging. I mean, just as as journalists as a journalist who's on this beat, um, just in order to stay informed, it's kind of an avalanche of a lot of dire news um, on a pretty daily basis. That said, you also come across all of the all of the clear indications and and reports and social scientists and technologists who tell us we basically have everything at our disposal to fix this problem now. And it's really just a matter of priority. So it's a it can be a bit of whiplash going back and forth between the hope and despair of um, thinking about the climate at this point. But there is um, there are a lot of indicators that we are really entering a new era. Um, it's not just, uh, I mean, what's happening underneath the Biden administration is quite um, phenomenal. But I think the whole idea of we're thinking about things a lot more holistically. And part of that is being forced upon people who maybe are not ready to be thinking about it holistically. But that is what's happening. The fact that we're connecting um, questions of environmental justice, of questions of who has access to what resources and who pays the price for um for what those resources cost the environment and communities. Uh, the fact that we're looking at um, having climate integrated into administration agencies across the Biden administration in a new way that has never been done before. The way that, uh, that universities are having environmental programs that bring together economists and psychologists and social scientists and um, that everybody is starting to realize that you cannot tease apart one part of this one part of this equation and just work on one problem and think that you can solve it because it is so inextricably linked to everything else because that's how we humans live we don't live in these separate bubbles we our professional lives are intertwined with our personal lives. The pandemic has made that very clear right, um, <laughs> right? there's all these ways that that I think for hundreds of years we've spent a lot of energy and gain tremendous amounts of knowledge by breaking things down into their constituent parts and looking at them closely. But I feel like right now is the moment when we're realizing how much we've lost by not by not helping keep those threads connected between each other, between subjects, between how we think about each other, between how we treat each other, between you know, how we treat the land. All of it is is becoming rapidly apparent that it's all connected and needs to be addressed collectively. It's exciting to see the interconnectedness. It makes it kind of overwhelming to think about, well, how much, what can I respond to? What can I affect? If everything's so, so connected and so big, you know, I, people can feel like an ant so small that how can they affect these big interconnected systems, right? They, we want to bite off one piece and say, okay, I, I can affect this. So that's how people get to straws. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and that and and that's and that's fine because if if you feel better by not using straws, that's great. But that that's also, um, I think the thing that people forget is we're all so talented in our own strange, quirky ways, right? We we do the thing that we do and we do it well, and then you ask us to do it something else, and we're completely clueless. But whatever thing that you're good at, you know, just do that. And do it in 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 service to to working on climate. And if that means talking, if that means being a stand up comedian, if that just means um, making art, if it means organizing your community, if it means writing, if it means uh, holing up in a cabin somewhere and um, and and thinking and coming out and emerging with new thoughts, all of these are can be directed towards climate action if if you so choose. Um, stopping at straws is is the failure because <laughs> there's just so much more that can be done. But I don't think that at this point, there are no wrong answers about how to be involved. We need to do everything. So as we kind of kind of wrap this up, we've been talking about storytelling and the stories you've told by going to to red states and peach farmers in, in Georgia. You know, what I hear you saying is that you don't 
direct a lot of people. You come in to conversations with curiosity rather than trying to steer or influence people, which is, I think, where a lot of climate concerned people are. They go around trying to convert, pressure, activate uh, people to, they're projecting their own anxiety or need onto other people. And what I hear you saying is, you're curious. Where, what, are you, what are you observing? You, which yeah. actually is going to, I think that's going to allow people to listen to you more and that their defenses aren't going to go up when you're curious about them rather than telling them what they should think, which is the way a lot of climate conversations go. Right, right. Because there is, um, I mean, especially I think with social media and with the democratization of of journalism and sharing stories, which is wonderful in so many ways and, and problematic in other ways, but um, I think we've all gotten really used to telling our stories putting them out there in the world. And it sometimes feels like maybe not so many people are actually listening to them. And so I think sometimes showing up as a journalist and just being all ears is um, can feel kind of profound. Mira Subramanian is a journalist covering culture and the environment whose reporting has taken her across the U.S. to discover how Americans perceive climate change in their own backyards. Thanks for coming on Climate One, Mira. I really appreciate talking to you. Thanks so much for having me, Greg. You've been listening to Climate One. We've been talking about the climate stories we tell ourselves and the need to listen to others with Mira Subramanian and Nathaniel Rich. To hear more Climate One conversations, subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review. It really does help advance the climate conversation. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Ariana Brocious is our producer and audio editor. Our audio engineer is Arnav Gupta. Director of Advancement is Steve Fox. Kelly Pennington directs our audience engagement. And Tyler Reed directs our operations. Dr. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton. <laughs>